This talk is entitled, What Every Adventist Scientist Should Know, The Coconino Sandstone. We've been going through a series on uh, what every scient Adventist scientist should know. We talked about the philosophy of science first. We've talked about various parts of is there a God. Uh, next week we'll be talking about genetic entropy, which is our last one. Um, we've talked about how old is life on the earth and was there a flood. And uh, we're currently waiting. Paleocurrence is our last one of that. We've talked, uh, we're talking about challenges to young life creationism and the coconut in the sandstone is our first in that series. And eventually we'll be talking about Ellen White's health messages. And uh, it's not all about creation. Um, and today we'll be talking about fossil vertebrate trackways in the Permian Coconino Sandstone, Arizona. Dr. Brand. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, I've been walking around the Coconino for, for, I don't know, since the 1970s. And right now I have a graduate student doing further work on this. So it's a very interesting subject. Um, the only fossils in this sandstone are these trackways, vertebrate trackways, and no body fossils, no bones, and they've been, they've been used to, to indicate that this is a desert deposit. We use the word aeolian, that means deposited by wind. Uh, so aeolian desert deposit. And we're going to um, Today, not just look at the, at the trackways. I'm using them essentially as an illustration of something, of a way of studying something. And we'll look at some broader implications of this. Scientific method, how do we, how do we use this? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not working from a naturalistic point of view. Um, I do use biblical insights to help me to understand. The scientific community doesn't do that. <coughs> And some decisions to make is, are these really desert dunes of, um, you know, um, and a million years for the deposit, or, or some several million years? Uh, or is it a flood deposit in, sh in a short time? Not <coughs> uh, I'm not going to prove to you which it is, although I have my definite points of view, and you'll see as we go along uh, what the evidence has to say about this. And naturalism would say you cannot use biblical insights. You're bringing God into the picture and you're bringing possibility of miracles into the picture. And you can't do that. And so you cannot use biblical insights. Well, I went out there, first of all, studying this with the question in my mind. Okay, are these really desert? Or were they formed some other way? Uh, wet sand, uh, underwater? Is there some other way? Because the, the evidence published evidence really was not convincing that it, these are desert sand dunes. <coughs> and so we'll talk about how this all works together. Uh, do we want to make our conclusion on evidence or on assumptions? Okay, naturalism is an assumption. Do we want to, we're satisfied with that or do we want to have evidence for what we decide? <coughs> Okay, just to, I'm going to give you the, the work I've done before as an illustration of how I approach this question. <clears throat> then we'll look at some broader implications. The uh, Coconino sandstone is this 300 foot thick layer. Well, at this point it's 300 feet thick. It gets up to 1,000 feet. But it's uh, pictured here as the, the prominent white band near the top of the Grand Canyon. It covers um, most of northern Arizona. <clears throat> It's a cross-bedded sandstone, which uh, here's a, a picture of cross-bedded sandstone. And the, the theory here is that it, it deposits this way. You have desert um, sand dunes and the wind comes this way and it deposits layer after layer here on the front. And you end up with deposits like this that are, that are cross-bedded. Within each of these, you see the horizontal lines, okay? Those are what we call bounding surfaces that separate sets of cross-beds. So between these two horizontal lines, you have all these sloping deposits 
which would be uh, cross beds, um, often formed in a desert. Okay, so here's an actual picture of a, of a cross bed of sandstone. You see the horizontal lines again, they separate sets. Between two horizontals, you have a set of these cross beds. And the way these would form, you'd have uh, the desert, the, the wind forming this set of, of uh, cross beds or dunes, and then you go above the horizontal line, and there's a, another set of dunes comes across and makes this layer, and so it goes. And then, <clears throat> so you, then you have animals walking on these dunes and leaving uh, tracks. And here are some of the tracks uh, found in the Coconino sandstone. You have a very nice detail preserved. You see toe marks. You see the print of the, of the foot. And uh, these are quite abundant in many places. But I wondered, is that, <coughs> is that the only option for interpreting them? Um, am I crazy to think, well, maybe it's underwater? Well, here you have a set of, nice set of dunes. Okay. You might be ships moving across above us. This is under the ocean off the east coast of North America. Water and wind does very similar things to sand. And therein is the problem. Uh, is there sufficient evidence to indicate what conditions were um, for this sandstone? So here we have uh, at least two conditions we can consider. Underwater dunes with animals uh, you know, swimming down and, and making tracks and then swimming back up, or a desert with the animals moving uh, on the desert sand. Now at the end, somebody will ask the question, how do you preserve dunes on, on sand? Well, that's an interesting puzzle. We'll get to that, ask that question, and we'll talk about it later. So here is a, a nice exposure of the Coconino sandstone in the Grand Canyon. And this is me the way I used to look, collecting data on these tracks. Um, and so here we have some, some um, tracks to illustrate this. Uh, very nice one here. Maybe we can have the, at least some of the lights off. Is that? Sure. Um, so these are somewhat, uh, not very big ones. There you go. Okay, and you can see the, the nice detail that is preserved. Here we have some larger ones. They're not as well preserved usually, but you still can see the individual toe marks on the footprint. Here's some real tiny ones. Um, obviously very well, very much detail. Well, Okay, geology, in geology, how do we study things like that? They, those were produced a long time ago, uh, you know, 5,000 to 200 million, whatever, a long time ago, and we can't go back. So geology has to work by using modern analogs. You study processes that happen right now, and then you try to see which ones are most like uh, what you see in, in the rocks. So I had a, a graduate student made this sand dune for me, and this is a, in a little uh, flume with, with water in it. So animals are walking and leaving tracks. And we can compare those then with the fossil tracks. And here's what we get. Here's another example of the fossil tracks. This is what you get on dry sand, on a dry sand dune. The, uh, the one on the top right, you, the sand tends to slide back and fill in all the details. Uh, whereas underwater, this is what you get on a, on a sloping surface like a dune, but underwater. This is the only one that gives you details, the one on the left, le uh, upper left. And so that's by far the most comparable <coughs> with these fossil tracks. But, you know, people might come up with all kinds of uh, explanations, why, why, what's wrong with that. Um, so th but there's another line of evidence that's very interesting and quite common in, in the Coconino sandstone. Here's an example. You see that the trail coming down from the north rim goes past this rock. And usually people walk back here and not see anything because in the daytime when the sun is shining straight down, you really don't see anything. So Dr. Art Chadwick, a friend of mine and I, we came down after dark. I hung up on this branch here and took a picture while he shined flashlights across it. And so you see you have a very interesting track. Uh, the animal is probably moving this way, this way or this way, you can't really be sure. And the, you take this lower set of tracks. They're all pointing towards the right. Here we have the back toes, the back feet, and the front feet, and each set is like that. All right, how does an animal walk sideways like that? Do you see your pets often doing that, running sideways? Try, try running down the basketball court sideways. Well, don't really try it, but this is 
This is an interesting problem. How do you produce those? Another example, this is in a, from a, a museum uh, just 20 minutes from here. Uh, it's a slab, 12 foot high slab of coconino taken from um, northern Arizona. You see, for instance, this one trackway that goes straight up, all the way up. That's an, a normal track. That's what you'd expect. It's like this one on the illustration on the left. The animal goes straight up, and the pointing, the way his toes are pointing will average the direction he's going. He may be pigeon-toed or whatever, but the average will be in the direction he's going. Okay, what about these? You, over here on the right again, you see all these tracks that are going sideways, trackways that are going sideways, one way or the other. All right, when you get there and you look at this slab, you notice one thing. They're, they're going either to the left or to the right, but all their toes are pointing straight up. Okay, this is on a sand dune, some sort. Uh, why are they pointing straight up? It's like the picture at the left, you notice the one that's going slanted. Uh, the, the average direction of the toes is approximately straight up um, the dune. Sometimes it can be at right angles to the direction that the animal is moving. Here are some examples. <coughs> Here's a uh, look at the, the lower picture. <coughs> right in the middle you have a trackway going to the right. Toes are pointing up. The animal is moving either to the right or to the left. And look at the top picture. This is very, very uh, clear. All these toes, all these tracks are pointing up, whereas the animal is moving at almost right angles. So how do you explain that? Uh, very unusual. Animals just don't walk. Well, crabs do, but you know some others. But vertebrates don't walk that way. Uh, well, okay. So I had a student work with me. We did a set of experiments in this uh, flume. Uh, this has sand in the bottom and salamanders, and water is flowing uh, from this side over to this side. We have a video camera recording the animal's movement. And often they will, the animals will walk straight with the current. Okay, that's a normal track. But often they're like this. They're trying to walk methodically forward, whereas the current is drifting them to the side. Now this could happen on a dune, be it underwater or, well, probably underwater. I don't think it could happen in the desert. But the <clears throat> they'll try to walk up, and there, there will be lateral currents, sideways currents, gentle currents that will flow back and forth. Um, when you're, the wind or water coming over a dune doesn't just come right over and down the slope. You can get, uh, go to a, a large sand dune in a storm, you crouch down at the base of the dune and you're, you're not getting any wind. It's going over you. But there can be these lateral currents moving sideways. And so this animal is trying to walk uh, forward, up in this picture, but he's being drifted sideways. And so, um, our camera setup allowed us to, uh, to exactly uh, draw each frame by itself. And so as the animals are drifting like this, you take the lower right number, uh, letter F. If they're drifting just the right, um, the right speed and the right way, you'll get a track just like that really odd one I showed you a bit before. The, uh, the t lower feet are here, the upper uh, feet, the front feet are here and they happen to end up in a line. And in any case, these tracks are, are moving to the side, but the toes are all pointing up. So that can happen underwater. This is a, a, an illustration from a uh, publication on this. <coughs> the, the trackways are drawn from photographs of actual trackways. The drawings of the animals, that's my interpretation of what's happening, how they are moving. Um, and making these tracks. So you take the, the, the one um, on the upper right. The, he's moving straight ahead as, you, as a normal animal should. Then a current comes and moves to the left. Then it drifts him sideways and all these toes are still move, pointing upward. Then maybe the current stops or he gets a hold finally and he goes again straight up. Well that kind of process can explain all of these very unusual uh, trackways in the coconino. So that's an underwater process. It cannot happen that way on a dry sand dune. Okay, so that's one, another line of evidence that really seems to point to underwater. I don't know how you could explain it on a desert dune, 
and nobody's been able to tell me how you could explain it. But there's something better, more interesting evidence. Uh, if you're walking across the desert and you're getting thirsty and all of a sudden you see this guy, okay, what would you think? You've got to start somewhere. Well, so what if you found fossils like that? Uh, how would you interpret it? He could be a flying creature, but these animals in the Coconino definitely don't have wings. They're four-footed uh, animals, tetrapods. So what, how would you interpret that? Well, um, sorry. Here are two examples. Uh, here's a, a slab, which has it's a nicely, uh, nice, uh, very undisturbed uh, surface. And you have this animal with very deeply impressed tracks right here. He's, he seems to be moving this way. Um, and if we look backwards now, you got a track here, another here, um, uh, and then another there. There should be another one here and here and here, but there are none. So where did he come from? Well, here's another one. The animal is moving this way. There's another animal here, but this one, Again, he's moving up to the, the upper left. And these are his first tracks that appear. This is a very smooth, undisturbed surface. Um, if you again follow backwards, track here, 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 should be one about here, another one here, and probably one still right here on the, as he's going back towards the lower right. But they're not there. There's no tracks. All right? You've got to start somewhere. So where did he come from? <coughs> well, let's look at this little cartoon again, and uh, they're, they're under the, consider these two environments that, that are possible. Um, in the desert, that's simply not possible. Uh, animals don't just suddenly appear on the desert. Uh, that's, uh, that would be indeed a miracle, and, and there's, nothing, there's nothing like that to be seen out there. But in the lower picture, if this is underwater, it's easy to explain. The animals can swim down, start walking, and swim up again. And you can have tracks starting or stopping. This is only possible underwater. <coughs> Here's the best one I've seen. Uh, this animal is, is moving sideways here, as a lot of them do. Then he disappears. Uh, but then he, or somebody just like him, appears up higher up, continues the, the journey in the same direction. Okay, how'd he get from here to here? Uh, there's no way he could jump for this size of animal, certainly not without leaving any evidence. He, he had to have swum up in the water and then gone down, kept walking. <coughs> okay, um, so what evidence do we have at this point? <coughs> the tracks basically require subaqueous. Now, I published this in the scientific literature in a very good journal, and it's been interesting to see how others have dealt with this through time. Uh, they've tried to find a way to explain those sideways trackways, some, you know, in, in a desert. Um, one paper published by a very well-known uh, track expert, he has a, a, a picture of a, of a slab with a lot of tracks, and he draws arrows showing there are about a dozen tracks going this way. But if you look at the picture of the fossil, uh, his arrows don't even come close to approximating what the tracks are saying. There's just a few uh, sets of maybe two or three tracks, and they're going in different odd directions. So he simply did something very, very superficial and, and um, can't, def can't be defended to try to explain how you can get my sideways tracks. None of them have ever tried to explain the ones that start or stop suddenly. Okay, they never even made an attempt to find another way to explain those. So this remains <coughs> in the literature as the best explanation. And yet, scientists, the scientific community, the geological community, is determined that the Coconina will be underwater, be, be in a desert. This is a very set interpretation that they're not willing to give up. And yet, it's a little bit puzzling because there are, there are cross bedded sandstones that are interpreted as underwater. So why not this one? Well, from, these, from this kind of thing, these, these uh, trackways, for instance, and the, and the Coconino sandstone, they come up with, with very broad scale 
interpretations of the environment of the Earth at different times in Earth history. And they want this to be, uh, to be in a desert. Even though the, the, the rocks right above it and below it are marine, they want this to be in a desert. And they won't give that up. And one thing is right now, they're, they're afraid that if they let it be uh, a subaqueous, it will support the, the creationists. They, they don't like that idea at all. So, so we're talking about an assumption which, is under, which underlies most of their interpretation. Okay, so the tracks require subaqueous. The substructure of the sandstone, which is what my student is studying right now and what another student studied before, it's not really like modern deposits. It's, it's different in some very important ways. The sand characteristics don't clearly indicate a desert. In fact, it's, it's quite problematic. <coughs> and so why don't they see this? Well, the literature has many, many papers saying this is Aeolian. And wh how do they, what do they base it on? Well, things like the sand grains are well-rounded, which is expected in a desert. They are uniform size, which is expected in a desert, and some other things. Um, I mean, it, we read, my student is going, finding all the literature you can find. So you try to trace those ideas back in the literature. Where do they come from? Mostly they come from the work of Edwin McKee, uh, a re geologist in the 30s and 40s, who worked out this interpretation of, of a desert deposit. And he, you, know, you read his papers carefully, he never looked at these sand grains under a microscope. Uh, he just lit in the field, used his hand lens, which is, doesn't work real well on, on fine grain sand. So our, our students make uh, thin sections of this rock, study it under a microscope, and they're not well rounded and they're not well sorted. Those simply were, were wrong. Um, <coughs> and so anyway, there, there are other problems with those interpretations um, that are being used. <coughs> so the interpretations that are, that are used don't really fit the evidence very well. And uh, part of also what they use um, are other features uh, of the sand, which they try to say, okay, this is Aeolian. But you'll read those papers carefully, and they say, well, this feature is on Aeolian wind dunes. But we also find it over here in subaqueous dunes. And so, you know, you, when you when you're have this kind of fuzzy evidence, what do you do with it? Well, it doesn't really clearly say how to interpret this. And so, uh, again, the assumption is very important in, in how they're interpreting this. Um, the theory that it has to be uh, in a long ages model, um, not definitely not in a flood. There's no such thing as a, as a global flood. And so that requires them to interpret all of this um, as wind deposited. <coughs> So there are some mainline science assumptions, what most of the geologists are using. One is naturalism. You do not, you do, there are not any, any uh, miracles in the past. Creation is out. Uh, global flood is out. Because that doesn't fit in the, the accepted paradigm of Earth history. Long ages, millions of years, evolution during that time. It doesn't fit, and so it's not, they're not allowed. <coughs> Um, let me talk a little bit more about, about this. Okay, if we say um, God can never do miracles, what, what are we saying? Well, everything in nature has to be explained by the laws of chemistry and physics. Now, I agree with that. Um, certainly when we're studying um, our, our uh, biochemists and our physiologists who come in here and give the lectures and do the research in this building, uh, are any of them going to p struggle with the question of should I interpret my experimental results as God tinkering with it? Uh, I don't think so. Do you, do you know of any scientist who, who has a problem struggling with this? How to interpret that in experimental science? Um, We've learned, there, there was a time, of course, a couple hundred years ago or more, when it was common to, to, to uh, look at things in nature that we can't understand and explain them as a direct miracle, some kind of mystical process. Well, 
through time, experience taught us that it isn't that way. If God, however God runs the universe, he doesn't tinker around day, day to day with, with things that are happening here. He made a set of laws. They run what's happening in our laboratories and in the universe. Okay? <clears throat> so it must follow natural law. Um, but when you, when you think about history, that's a little different. Um, if we understand fully how the cell, living cells were, does that explain how they came to be? No, it doesn't. We're talking about a different, something very different at that point. And are the laws of chemistry and physics that we understand, are they adequate to explain that? <coughs> now here we are in this building. Um, it's got a solid roof and ceiling and uh, from, from the, the uh, laws of physics, we know how that keeps the rain out. So we sit here and we're very dry. Uh, we don't get wet <coughs> because of the laws of chemistry and physics. But if I take this bucket of water here and I, and I uh, carry it over here and I dump it on his head, okay, what's going to happen? He's going to get very wet. Okay, did I break any laws, chemistry or physics? No, I just, I'm a thinking being, personal being. I can make a decision, take action, and change the course of events. No laws are broken. Okay, God, God is, we know him as a personal being, a wise being. He can decide to do something, interject a force, a forces into this earth, change the course of events. Okay, that's a, well, that's a miracle. We, didn't, we would see it as a miracle, but it, it's, not, it's not magic. I think his miracle, I don't think his miracles are magic. He is a, a, um, a very wise, um, mathematically oriented, super scientist type. He does things which we can't fathom. How he could put a living cell together is just totally beyond me. I, but, he, but he does it. <coughs> but, I, but I believe if we could ultimately understand, we could actually, to some extent at least, understand how he did that. That, that doesn't mean we could do it but we would understand. He, he does things. Okay, so a global flood, did he, did that, was that magic? No, I don't think so. Somehow he changed the course of events in ways that only he uh, can do. Okay, and so if I make a, a rule that says he can't do that, he can't do things that are not ordinary, is that going to change history? I don't think so. Is he going to say, oh, these guys have made this rule. I better not violate that rule. Uh, I don't think that's going to influence him at all. So <clears throat> to me, true science is wanting to know what really happened. Not taking a set of assumptions and beginning with the assumptions. I want to begin with evidence. Biblical clues, which we can use to help us to, to think of what experiments to do, what observations to make. Uh, to understand what happened. <coughs> okay, let me. Uh, I talked about modern analogs. Uh, here's a, here's an ancient sand dune deposit, um, sandstone, and this this is not the the Coconino. Uh, this is the Navajo sandstone. Um, the Coconino is the same kind of structure, but the way Coconino weathers, you could never get a picture like this. It's just doesn't preserve it that way. But um, <coughs> so how do we know how this formed? Sorry, how, how this upper picture, how that sandstone formed? Well, as I mentioned, we have to use modern analogs. We don't have any other way. We don't have time machines or whatever. So we have to use modern analogs. How things happen today. Uh, when rivers deposit sediment, what does that process look like? What do the sediments look like? When deserts, um, you know, the wind produces uh, deposits, what does it look like under the ocean, um, all kind of different things. We look at all of those and we try to see which one matches the ancient uh, formations. Which one can explain uh, this sandstone we see in the upper picture? Um, <coughs> okay, so here's a desert in the lower picture and this undersea. 
um, deposit. Well, look up here at the what happens to be the Navajo sandstone, and you see these approximately horizontal lines. You see a whole series of them across here. And between each of those sets of parallel lines is a set of these sloping cross beds, like you would get in a, in a desert. Okay, so th the idea is that apparently um, whatever it was, wind or water, it deposited these dunes going across to the, to the left, and then something smoothed this off, and then you have another set of those sloping dunes above on top of that, then another set coming across on top of that. So one after another, you get these sets of cross beds. And here in the, I didn't count these, but there are what, maybe a dozen or maybe less. But in the Navajo, if you see the whole thing, you've got uh, many of these, maybe a couple <coughs> dozen. In the Coconino Sandstone, we've counted 14 of those, of those sets of cross beds coming across. <coughs> All right, where can we find that process happening on the earth today. Do we have a modern analog that even fits at all what happens in these ancient sandstones? Well, here we have, um, the lower left, we have sand dunes down here uh, near Mexico. Uh, and there are many places in the world where you have very extensive sets, you know, bodies of these, of these sand dunes. Then here on the right, you see them under the ocean. All right. <coughs> There's a, there's a crucial difference between this one at the t in the top picture and these lower ones. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of desert sand dunes, but they are, the wind is blowing the sand around. It is not building one set on top of another. Um, they just, the process that you see illustrated in the top picture, that's something that simply does not happen on the earth today. So we really don't have an analog for these ancient sandstones. We have, what was happening here is very different from what happens on our earth today. Um, it, why was it so different? Well, the difference, the conditions had to have been very, very different. And this is just one example. I could give uh, quite a few more if we had the time. Other kinds of geological situations where you don't have anything happening on the earth today that is like what happened in the past. Um, <clears throat> so what were the conditions? Well, um, I can't give evidence in a way that I could publish in a scientific journal. Um, I read the Bible, and I, I believe that gives me a correct clue as to what those would have been, say the global foot. But I, I can't, you can't just go out and do some observations and say, okay, that's what it was. What I can say is uh, my trackways were not produced um, in, a, in a desert. Uh, something else has to explain it. Um, uh, if, can I say even that the entire Navo, uh, the entire Coconino was, was underwater? Well, that'd be kind of hard to really even come up with that. Um, but when I look at the Earth today and I see these evidences for very different conditions, I have to think, what could those have been? Uh, they don't fit what happens on the earth today. So maybe the Bible knows what it's talking about after all. So desert dunes in a million years, well, that's, uh, that's a, um, a one paradigm, one worldview, how to understand it. It's based on the assumption of naturalism. Um, if I don't take that as my assumption, then I free to think about other possible explanations. Um, can the Bible actually give me insights? Is it, does the uh, God who inspired the Bible, does he actually know more about geology than I do? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, I want evidence-based um, work, not assumption-based work. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends, um, an Adventist theologian not too far from here, I've heard him say in public presentations that Science has facts, religion has assumptions. Well, now wait a minute. Um, is, is this naturalism, is that a fact? No, that's an assumption. And that is the undergirding foundation of, of what basically is done in science in history, studying history, studying origins. 
Um, so, no, religion is not the only thing that has, has assumptions. It has some. Uh, what there are, any point of view you take, it begins with some assumptions that we have to take by faith. Every point of view is, is like that. Um, and so one doesn't, isn't more factual than the other. I have more confidence in the biblical insights because I know who's behind it. That's the difference. Um, there is no, um, those who advocate naturalism, the idea that there's never been any miracles, they don't have any kind of God standing behind their ideas. They would not even, they'd be uh, appalled at the idea to even suggest that. So, <coughs> um, when we go out and do research, we can take biblical insights and we can use those to suggest hypotheses to test, just like we did with the Coconino sandstone. Um, and I have confidence that if I do that, it will give me an, an advantage. Now, does that mean that every idea I come up with will be right? No, I mean, they're creationists who make that mistake. They come up with an idea, well, I got this in the Bible, so I know what I'm talking about. No, e every scientist, when he starts to study something, he, he, will ha he or she will have to go through probably several different ways of trying to understand it before finding one that works. And that'll be the same thing here when we use biblical insights. It doesn't tell me, I don't find the word coconino sandstone anywhere in my Bible uh, or, or anything like that, but it can steer us in a certain direction, say look in this direction and you'll find something interesting. And when I do that, I go through various interpretations as I did with this study. Before if I understood what the evidence seems to be saying. But, but we can do that and um, make definite progress. <clears throat> so our results challenge the desert Aeolian hypothesis. We also know that science can't study miracles. We can agree on that. All of us can agree on that. Um, natural, the, the one thing that naturalism actually does that I think is constructive, it reminds us we cannot study how miracles happen. Science cannot, has no ability to tell us that miracles did happen or that they didn't. Uh, science cannot dictate that. It cannot tell us there were no miracles. But, we, but it, it reminds us that we can't study how any such events happened. We can, we can, if God intervened in history, we can't study his actions, but we can study the evidence left behind like the evidence in this, in this sandstone. We can study the evidence and it may point back and say, well, there must have been something very different happening in the past. Maybe even what, what God told us, uh, even though science can't uh, demonstrate that. Um, creationists who do the kind of work that I do, they, they, they get blasted in the literature often for studying miracles. Okay, did you see, um, the things that I was looking at and the experiments and this, the, the, the way I was thinking, did you see that I was bringing any miracles in? No, the evidence I think points to something very different uh, in the past, but we don't, we don't try to study miracles. We just do good science and the only thing we get from the Bible is, is suggestions, insights, that things were different in the past. And we can put those to use uh, in how we do things. <clears throat> and if you do that, um, even though the, the, the scientists out there may not like our, our approach, our conclusions, you can get, if you do careful work, you do quality work, you can get it published in the scientific literature. So these are several papers on this vertebrate um, sandstone material. This one was uh, published in the journal Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology, Paleoecology. It was later republished in a book called Benchmark Papers in Geology. Uh, this one is a journal Geology. Um, that's, that's probably the, the well, you, you've probably all heard of the journals Nature and Science. Okay, uh, those are kind of the, the, the top journals in science overall. Geology fills a, a similar role within the field of geology. So that paper was there and then others in other good journals. <coughs> so we can indeed um, do very good science if we get 
if we allow uh, God to give us some suggestions. And then we follow those using the methods of science. Okay, we've got lots of time for questions. I finished a little early. I figure don't keep talking if you've done what you need to say. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned there were no fossils in this layer, is that correct? No body fossils, no bones. I was wondering what did the salamanders eat? <laughs> were there any leaves or how That's can you explain the large area, many hundreds or thousands of mm -hmm. square miles of pristine accretion without mm -hmm. any flotsam and no jetsam? No plants, no plant marks from plants. There, there's none. And that's another puzzle. Uh, do you, have I seen other geologists commenting on it? Not in the literature. Um, although I spent some time out there with a, a friend who is an atheist geologist who differs with me on, on these tracks. But we spent time looking out there and he's, uh, he, I would say he's a pretty open-minded guy. He, we were walking over modern dunes and he was asking the question. Now, here we see these plants and they're making marks on the sand. Why do we not see anything like that in the, in the coconut, <coughs> in the coconina or other of these sandstones? So he's open-minded and wondering, but you never see it published in the literature. Are there fossils above and beneath? Beneath the coconino? Yeah, the, the underneath it is a hermit shale, um, which is subaqueous, probably shallow marine. Right above it is um, definitely marine limestones uh, with sharp boundaries separating all of these. And so, so you've got the environment was all under the ocean. Then all of a sudden, with no transitional evidence there, just sharp line, and then there's the Coconino. And above that, there's an, another sharp line. Well, not always, but anyway, there's a pretty distinct line. And then is marine. So what would you expect to happen if you have a transition from this cover being covered by an ocean to becoming a desert? You should have a long transition of changing conditions, it would seem like, but you don't. So there your, are fossils. Salamander there are tracks, fossils in those. your salamander tracks then were made by comparison with salamander tracks today. That's how you determined a salamander? Okay, I, I can't say for sure mine are salamanders. Um, they're, um, those tracks, fossil tracks, are either reptile or amphibian. And actually the trackways do not have the type of evidence you need to decide which it is. I but did there are see reptiles some, that are, that are subaqueous. I did see some swishy tail marks on there on one of them that would come from a salamander or something Could similar. Be. Usually you don't have tail marks actually, but there are a few. Besides uh, providing support for a large-scale flood, mm -hmm. what other challenges does the subaqueous hypothesis uh, present to the Long Ages model? Mm -hmm. um, okay, if, if you take the standard scientific view, you would expect some things to be underwater. Um, that's not its in itself a problem. But there are, you put that together with a lot of other things that we don't have time to go into today. And there's, there's a, there's, it, the evidence accumulates that it was a very different condition. And, and in fact, um, <coughs> geologists look through the geologic column. They look at the Cambrian deposits, um, you know, Ordovician and so on, up the Mesozoic where you have dinosaurs. And they, they look at the deposits in different places all over North America and, and evaluate what they think the, the environment was. And starting with the Cambrian, going up through um, a reasonable part of the, well, actually most of the Paleozoic, the lower third, uh, almost everything's underwater. Okay, that sounds, does that sound like maybe the flood? Uh, no, it, that doesn't prove it's a flood. It proves that it was, it shows that it was underwater. 
and they'll interpret it, they will always interpret it different than, than a, a, you know, a global flood. Um, they interpret it basically as shallow seas covering the continents, um, which later gradually dried out, and as you get higher in the column, you get less and less water, till it's finally uh, as we know it now. So that to me looks like a, a one-way process. You started underwater, for whatever reason, you gradually changed and became less and less water covered until finally it, it's dry like it is now with uh, my lawn drying out if I don't keep it thoroughly watered. <laughs> so, it, so it adds another layer of su support yes. that all these layers mm -hmm. are subaqueous. Yeah. And there are other features, like I say, would be whole different talks. Um, there are other features in the rocks that just are not like what happens today. And Ariel Roth has talked about some of these. These individual layers, rock layers that go for you know, huge distances. Well, nothing like that happens today. Things are deposited by rivers or in lakes or, you know, it's, it's very different in the past. Was the, uh, the idea that the Coconino sandstone was deposited under air used at one time to try to uh, discredit the uh, idea of a biblical flood? Well, <clears throat> okay, that just by itself wouldn't, dis wouldn't discredit it, but, um, well, you, you, in a sense you can, uh, you can say, well, you can't have a desert in the, in the flood. I don't think we know that much detail. Do we know that there wasn't a time in the flood when it, the water level was low and there was a high wind, you know, um, that could be. I, I, I don't think it's the best idea, but it, it could be. We can't say it's wrong. Um, but some people would say, yeah, this is a desert that's contrary to the Noah's flood, so it can't be. Another question is, <clears throat> when you have these layers that are, uh, appear to be stacked on top of each other, does that suggest the possibility that you're dumping in sand from somewhere else and then spreading it across. Um, mm -hmm. And if so, has there any idea of where all that sand came from? Okay, the, you know, we don't know why the ancient deposits deposited one set on top of another. We know it's very different conditions. So these layers, one above the other, that's one factor. Another factor is there tends to be more uniformity of direction now than there would be in a modern desert. And so it looks like you had a, an enormous sand supply coming from somewhere with, with perhaps a very uh, strong current just flowing this in one layer after another. And as far as where it came from, um, I don't think anybody has really determined that for the Coconino, but for some of these others, that sandstones that are very similar, like the Navajo, sandstone, which is also an enormous body of sand. They find evidence uh, that that came from over by the Appalachians. Now this is not done by some wild-eyed creationist. This is a st just standard. They take the sand, they analyze it very carefully, all the, the, uh, the, the elemental components. They try to see where it could have come from. They have it coming from the Appalachians for various uh, of these western sandstones. They trace it, at least, uh, at least, you know, possibly trace it across Texas and coming over here. That's a pretty big event, I would say. Are there other places in the world where something analogous to the Coconino sandstone happened at about the same time? Yes, um, not always exactly the same time, but there, there are similar kind of deposits with similar tracks with similar oddities. In, uh, in uh, Brazil and in various places in Britain and, I th and in Europe. So there, this is not an isolated phenomenon. I, nobody asked how you preserve footprints in sand. <laughs> but yeah. Have you had shown a picture of uh, the dunes underwater. Mm -hmm. Uh, modern dunes underwater. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to uh, d 
jig in or drill into <laughs> any of those dunes and see what the, the bedding of that looks like? Or, I mean, that seems a pretty tricky proposition. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> there, are, there are a lot of papers about these in, in the literature. And they, what they can do basically is survey from, from above the form of these and exactly where they are and all that kind of thing. But to find out what's happening inside, there really isn't a good way to do that. And that's one of the problems uh, in studying these sandstones. How do you get, you can, you can study modern dunes. And um, one geologist at least, actually McKee himself, got a grant to go into a set of these dunes and bulldoze out a whole channel right through it. <laughs> and so you can get good data. How do you get that underwater? That's really hard. There's um, some of the papers, some, some ideas in some of the published papers talk about the difference between slow, uh, flow, that is low energy underwater processes and high energy. And it makes different kinds of, of deposits. And the high energy has promise. It, it's something we really need to look into. And we're trying to figure out how are you going to do that. We need a big flume, research flume, made to do that. <laughs> Maybe we'll figure that out. Oh, how do you preserve? So you've got an animal walking on a sand dune, be it underwater or desert, doesn't matter. Why would that track be preserved? Wouldn't the currents just destroy it? Um, well, you'd think that. However, the fact that they're preserved says that didn't happen. So that, that you know, we can say that that didn't happen. If it did, you wouldn't find them. But why do we find them? Well, um, in some of the quarries in Arizona where they, where they get this Coconino sandstone, they get it, it, it splits out in nice slabs used for construction, um, and especially for like facings on a building or something. Um, it splits out on the nice, these nice slabs, and so there's something in the sand that makes it split at a person, certain point. It doesn't just fracture into all kinds of pieces. It splits in these flat slabs. So there has to be something right there in this sand that makes it weaker right at that point so that it will crack at that point later. Uh, now, if there's a little difference in grain size, that can do it, and that often probably is, is the factor. Uh, if there is some clay, some mud in between, that will definitely do it. But there is no clay or you know, mud in the Coconino. It's just sand. And so the animal has to walk on a surface that then the next thing that comes over, it has a little difference in grain size so that it will split right at that point and split along the tracks and also on the smooth surface. So you have to have that condition before you'll ever find the track. The animals can be walking over the sand, and if they don't crack at that level, you'll never see the track. If, if you are walking through the Coconino, and just with random, or well, obviously not random, but uh, natural splits, let's put it that way. Mm. What percentage of the sandstone is covered with tracks? We're looking at 1%, we're looking at 10%, we're looking at 0.01%. Oh, well, that's hard to give a percentage, but what you, we can um, summarize that pretty well in some ways. Um, for instance, Along the Hermit Trail in Grand Canyon, that's one of the nicely exposed areas. You can hike, the Hermit Trail goes right up through this Coconino sandstone. And you have these sets of dunes going up. There are about 14 of them. Well, it's been known for a long time that the, there are no tracks in about the lower 20 feet and in the upper half. So a graduate student and I wondered, okay, why? What's controlling that? And so we did this careful analysis, doing what we call measuring a section from the bottom to the top, identifying where these bounding surfaces are, the separate sets, where those are and where the tracks are. We found out out of, out of these 14 sets, only two have tracks. So the first set has no tracks, and then right at that bounding surface, the first maybe five centimeters above that are just churned up with animal animals walking there. 
And then the rest of that set has tracks. Then there's none in the next set. Then there's one more set that's quite thick. That's where most of the tracks are. And you get up to the top of that, top of that set and you can see the last trackway fading out right at that boundary. And there's no more in all the rest of it. Okay, so why the tracks just concentrated in these certain places? And it's that way other places. There's one place where there's a, there's a, a, a wash coming down as you eroded its way through the sandstone. And so, okay, over here on this side of the wash, um, there are no tracks in the lower half of the San Coconino, but there are a lot of tracks in the upper half. Right over here on this side of the wash, there are lots of very beautiful tracks uh, in, the, in the lower part of it, and none in the upper part. Okay, what's going on? You got, looks like you've got animals. Okay, here's how I would suggest that happens. You have flowing water depositing this sand, and groups of animals get caught in this water. They're being carried along. They come down and make tracks. The water carries them off somewhere else, and you have no more tracks. Okay, that is a, a logical interpretation. If you don't have something like that, uh, why no tracks? I, and I, I mentioned this atheist geologist I, I work with, discussed these things with. He was there and looked at all this with me. He said there's no difference in the rock that would indicate a different environment. It has to be biological. That's all he would say. Okay, biological, what's that? Well, why are there animals there? Why are there not? And that doesn't do with the environment. It's, it's and my suggestion would, would explain that. You have them being washed through. Only sometimes do they land and make tracks. And so in those places, you have a lot of tracks. The rest of it, there's no tracks. And we see the same thing. Another of our students is studying the Navajo sandstone, which is a very large body of sand. And it's, it's, it is even more strongly interpreted as a wind deposited. And they're studying, th this, uh, the Navajo has, has these sets of cross pits, one above the other, and I showed a picture of them. Well, <coughs> there's a place where there are dinosaur tracks and other reptile tracks, a lot of them. And he's studying these, they're very good tracks. They, find, they look all around the area, there are no tracks except in this one set of cross pits an area maybe 30 meters wide and not as wide this way. Okay, you probably have to go 100 miles to find the next trackways. Okay, why? Why would you have just this? And this is not just one kind of animal. There's, there's a half a dozen. So a whole fauna, a whole group of animals, all of a sudden got there, made lots of tracks, and then they were gone. See, that that's doesn't represent a normal living environment. Something very strange is happening there. And uh, again, you could have them washed in and then make tracks and then they're gone. Okay, so what do other scientists, how do they deal with these? Well, um, if, you, if you know, you know, you, you know this is a millions of years process, and the animals are, are living there, you, you, you know that has to be the right interpretation. Um, so you, you see these oddities, and you, well, they're just, they're just odd. We don't know how to explain them. They're just oddities. Um, and, and this friend of mine, the atheist friend of mine who was out there with me, I showed him something unusual in these tracks that I think is quite significant. And he looked at that, and he says, you do have a different search image, the, the image of what you're looking for. He says, I would have looked at that and thought, well, that's odd, and gone on. But if, you, if, you, if you're not wearing the blinders of naturalism, your, your eyes are open, uh, then you see that and you wonder, is that significant? Uh, and uh, some often they turn out to be. If you, I say blinders, if you, if you have a certain worldview and you can't go outside of that, your blinders only allow you to see things that fit your worldview. Now, there are unusual people who will, who will look more broadly and they'll get past that. But often that doesn't happen. For one thing, if you take it too seriously, you might lose your job at a university. Um, I can give another example of that from, from longer ago. Um, there was a physicist 
studying some phenomena in his laboratory with a, with a what we'd call a monitor. I, it was different. I don't know how they made them that time. Uh, and uh, you see various effects of radiation and things. Well, he was working in his lab and he saw this monitor glowing when it should not have been. Well, he wondered, why is it glowing? Other people had seen this, other physicists had seen this, and apparently thought, well, that's odd, and, you know, and went on. But he, his mind was more open to, to, to ask serious questions. Of why is it glowing? And this started about three weeks of intensive research, almost day and night. And, and he discovered by this x-rays. The others could have, but they had their blinders on. They didn't notice odd things. Uh, I don't know what that did to his lifespan, but anyway, he discovered x-rays. Are there any pollen grains in the Coconino or the Navajo? Pollen grains. Don't believe so. At least not in the Coconino. I couldn't say for sure about the Navajo. I haven't heard of it. There is, the Navajo does have, in contrast to the Coconino, the Navajo does have a few skeletons of vertebrates, vertebrate animals. And these are in places that, where it's not like the normal cross beds. You have, um, um, sort of limestone lenses in there. there. There was a break of some sort in there. And some vertebrates got in there and got buried. And uh, one thing that and other evidence tells, tells some of us that the flood, uh, we often think of it as much too simple terms. Water gone came up, a lot of things settled out, the water came down. No, it wasn't like that. It was a very complex event. And you must have had um, times during there when, when the water level was low and even when wa land was sticking out. Because there are trackways scattered here and there uh, that, that needed, probably weren't animals that, that were swimming way down under the water. These, these were like dinosaurs. Um, you have some levels that have trackways. <coughs> Well, <clears throat> it looks like everybody's done with questions. We want to thank you very much for coming and presenting. Um, I'm sure I speak for many when I say I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you.